Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order on Monday, May the 18th at 7.02 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are here for us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden? Present. Council Member Brown? Here. Council Member Katati? Council Member Davis? Council Member Moffitt? Here. And Council Member Shule? As some of you may have recognized as we came in the uh, lobby, there's a, a bulletin board full of uh, pictures and photographs of our public works department and uh, the type of work that they do. So probably uh, a lot of us don't appreciate it until we run into a pothole or some, some kind of complaint, but they keep, keep the city running. And today we want to recognize National Public Works Week. And I'm going to ask Marvin Williams, the public director of public works, if he would join me. The proclamation speaks to the fact that whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings, and solid waste collection, whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the qualify, quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials, whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of this very importance of the work that they perform. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have our proclaim the week of May 17th through May 23rd, 2015, as National Public Works Week in the city of Durham, and I call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. I witness my hand, Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 18th day of May, 2015, and I present this to Marvin for any comments he might have. Just real quickly, thank you again, Mayor Bell, members of the council, for acknowledging National Public Works Week. Um, we're one of the departments that people typically forget about until there's a problem like the mayor mentioned, but we are a vital part of the city operation to make things go on a daily basis. So just on behalf of the staff of the Public Works Department, thank you for the recognition. And this week we will have a couple of functions going on. We're continuing with our job shadowing efforts or employees between our maintenance divisions, stormwater, GIS, and engineering divisions are swapping jobs to learn more internally about what we do. We're going to be working with Pearson Town Elementary School to perform a trail cleanup this week as well. And on Friday, we're having our annual departmental luncheon that all of you in the city council and the city administration are invited to at Southern Boundaries Park, right near the Operations Center at 12 o'clock. So please, if your schedule allows, please feel free to join us. But thank you again for the recognition. This next recognition is uh, for excellence for the American Tobacco Trail and pedestrian bridge. And I'd like to ask Mr. Reginald Scales of Parsons Brickenhoff Engineering to come forth and join me. And I, I, I guess if you look at 
uh, things that are happening around Durham. And we always talk about good things happening around our community and then for our community. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's not so difficult, but in the end, it's the final results is what counts. And certainly the pedestrian bridge across I-40 is one of those. I think nobody thinks about when it was supposed to be done. Everybody now enjoys it. And certainly we recognize, and fortunately other people have recognized it. So before I break it, I'm going to give this to the skills for comments that you may have on that. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Um, I, uh, first of all, when all is said and done, as all is said and done, you, you summed it up very nicely. My personal involvement, Council and, and Mayor, goes back to 2001 on this project. So it's been a, a long and interesting journey. But anytime you have something that is innovative, something that is unique, groundbreaking, which is what the city of Durham has, it takes time, energy, and effort, and, and, and creativity. Uh, tonight, uh, we are here, myself, Tim Hayes. This is the guy who actually drove this project through on the Parsons Brinker offside. Can't say enough about Marvin Williams and his staff, who were wonderful in terms of moving these things. We ran into a lot of roadblocks, as you would imagine, but they kept things moving. So, to be very proud of the staff and the, and the job they did, that that they do for you. This award uh, is uh, from the American uh, Council of Engineering Companies, and that is an advocacy group for engineering nationally and even internationally. Uh, there is a North Carolina chapter, which we submitted your bridge for an award, and it was selected also. So it was recognized last year by the state chapter. After it won, we submitted it for a national award. And just to give you an idea of the caliber of projects that were there, there were two finalists. Uh, one project uh, dealt with tunnels around uh, the Niagara River. Canada is trying to reduce their reliance on fossil fuel. That was considered, that was a finalist. And the other project was the east span of the Bay Bridge uh, for in San Francisco. That project actually won. So um, shoot for the stars and uh, shoot for the moon. If you don't win, you land among the stars. So let me put my glasses on and read this for you. Um, the American Council of Engineering Companies Engineering Excellence Awards Competition National Recognition Award presented to the city of Durham for the American Tobacco Trail Pedestrian Bridge, April 2015. Congratulations. Comments by members of the council. Uh, if not, I'm going to make a comment. I, I had the privilege to attend the Bimbe Festival uh, this weekend. And uh, I, I went probably close to maybe 5 o'clock or so, but may, maybe four, between 4 and 5. Uh, I wasn't the only one that came. Uh, it was a traffic jam. But it was a good traffic jam. And I, I also want to compliment the Parks and Recreation Department for what I think was a, an excellent uh, pulling together the, the event. Uh, people I talked to were very pleased. The weather turned out beautifully. Uh, the park was large enough to accommodate everybody, but it was close enough that people could move in and sort of relax. Many bought chairs, some were just on the grounds. And I also want to thank the Durham County government also because they allowed parking at the stadium uh, for free, and which that uh, really, really helped out. And they had the police there on on hand to direct the traffic. So that sort of was a, a great event, a great time. Uh, and I want to, again, congratulate the people, who, staff in particular, who stayed there from the morning until the evening and uh, made it such a great event. <laughs> if no further comments, I'm going to recognize the city manager for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Likewise, City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And uh, likewise, City Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No items. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, the agenda consists of the consent agenda items first, and if an item is pulled by a council member of the public, we'll deal with that later in the agenda in the program. First item is street and infrastructure acceptance. Item two is dedicated funding source follow-up performance audit for March 2015. 
Item three is home loan and related documents for the Quit School project. Item four is the Durham Amtrak station agreements. Item five is increase in civil penalties for parking violations. And I told the city manager I got a $10 parking ticket. <laughs> I, I paid it. If, if, if it had been $20, I wouldn't gotten that ticket. But I, I, paid, I paid the $10 parking ticket. <laughs> Uh, yeah. It's working, yeah. Uh, item six is municipal agreement between the city and the North Carolina Department of Transportation for the USDOT Sharp 2 C16 grant, the evaluation of the impacts of smart growth on travel demand. Item seven is interlocal agreement between the city of Durham and the MPO member agencies for local matching funds for federal transportation planning grants. Item eight is proposed revisions to the Durham City Code to permit reimbursement for city constructed infrastructure. Item nine is establishment of service area and service area fee for the Southeast Regional Lift Station. Item 10 is adoption of proposed water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2015-2016. Item 11 is proposed update to fee schedule for water and sewer capital facility fees. Item 12 is interlocal cooperation agreement for the collection of taxes between the County of Wake and City of Durham. Item 13 is purchase order contract between Medallion Athletic Products, Inc. and the City of Durham for an artificial turf soccer field upgrade at the CM Herndon Athletic Park. Item 14 is compensation and classification plan recommendations. Item 15 is intergovernmental agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey for operation and maintenance of the City of Durham Rainfall and Stream Flow Network, FY 2016. Item 16 is ordinance amending City Code Chapter 70, Article 1, Section 70-25, resale of water and or sewer service. Item 17 is contract SW-38, 2015 sidewalk repair project. Item 18 is contract SW-38C, 2015 sidewalk inspections. And item 19 is an item that can, find on, can be found on the general business agenda. And item 24 is an item to be found on the general business agenda as a public hearing. Item 29 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. That is the consent agenda and obtain a motion to approve the consent agenda. It's been properly moved and second, second moved by the mayor pro tem, second by Councilman Katati. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. Vote passes seven to zero. Thank you, and we have the general business agenda Item 19 is proposed fiscal year 2015-16 budget and fiscal year 2016-2021 capital improvement plan and the city manager will present those to the council and the public. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members of the city council, city attorney Baker. City clerk, city staff, and residents present here this evening are viewing on the Durham Television Network. It continues to be my honor to be entrusted to lead this great organization and over 2,400 employees committed to service within the organization and within the community. I am pleased to be for you this evening to officially present the proposed budget for the City of Durham for the 2015-2016 fiscal year. I believe this year's budget represents a tipping point putting us at a place where we see the vision of just a few years ago taking on all the characteristics of reality. We can see it, we can feel it, we can put it to use for the benefit of the community. It's a vision that's not yet complete, but one that represents an achievement that is the result of deliberate planning for Durham's future, a future we're experiencing now. Look around as you stroll down Paris Street or just take a drive down Main and Chapel Hill Streets in the heart of downtown. Fuchsia penguins now welcome visitors at the new 21C Museum Hotel. The frontage of the old McPherson Hospital stands as a reminder of our past, but at the same time serving as a wonderful historic entrance at the new Residence Inn on Main Street. On Chapel Hill Street, the familiar yellow and white of mutual savings and loan is being reborn as the new hotel. In East Durham, where Anger Avenue connects with Driver Street, a recently completed streetscape is spurring a new vitality and investment in that area. <clears throat> On Roxborough Street, where new housing, homes and apartments called Southside continues to rejuvenate a long neglected neighborhood. All around, we see the change that has transformed our great city, 
from downtown to our neighborhoods in a matter of just a few years. And I'm proud to say as city manager that Durham is ready for our future. Years of planning and prioritizing programs and projects and the steady leadership of Mayor Bell and the City Council have put us here at this time. So what does our future hold? No one really knows. Some factors are within our control, but some that may have a large impact on our long-term plans and our economic growth and development or not. Just as we managed our operations in what be, might be described as tight budget times a few years ago, to meet our community's most pressing needs, we must continue to be strategic in our decisions to be where we want to be in the next five years as a growing city. For the past four years, Durham's got it. The city's strategic plan has been the foundation of our planning, driving our operational needs, and guiding the budget process for the city. Quite simply, these are areas of focus that you've told us, if done well, make our city a great place to live, work, and play. This year, we've refreshed our strategic goals to reflect what residents tell us is important to them. We asked you what success in all those areas would look like. We believe, after listening, that we're on even stronger footage to use our strategic plan as the basis for our future. These goals will continue to support and connect programs and services that we can measure to ensure that resources are used efficiently, but also to determine that they are meeting the needs of the residents. In planning for the 2016 budget, we continue to scrutinize and prioritize services and programs, making sure they support our strategic goals so that their outcomes help improve the city's economy, neighborhoods, management, and infrastructure. Using the strategic plan is now a way of life in this organization. It isn't a phrase how the city of Durham does business. <clears throat> as in years past, we listened to elected officials and residents in many different ways as we prepared the budget. Again, thank you to the mayor and city council for your guidance and participation from the beginning of the budget process and to the residents who made their voices heard as well. Each budget continues to be a collaboration process that cannot be done well without the input of the council and the public. As usual in developing the budget, we looked at overall resources, financial and human, to understand what we need to sustain an innovative, innovative and high-performing organization, including cost of services, adequate resources to provide them, including fair and reasonable tax rates, along with the responsible debt ratios, bond ratings, and reserves. At the same time, we continue to monitor potential state legislative impacts on our budget. As I indicated earlier, uncertainty at the legislature continues to affect our budget projections and decisions, similar to other large cities across our state. While major state revenue, while well, major state shared revenues account, sales tax continues to increase, other fees were eliminated. Most significantly, the business privilege license tax, totally more than $2.9 million, had to be replaced from another source. The proposed total budget for fiscal year 2015-16 is $386.5 million, a nearly 1% decrease from last year. The proposed general fund budget, which covers the city's core services, is $170.2 million, a nearly 3% decrease from last year. Again, years of aligning city operations to meet the community's highest priorities and improving collaboration be between city departments and providing services have served us well. Not only did we avoid having to look for possible budget cuts to balance the budget this year, I am pleased to say that a tax increase is also not needed. The proposed tax rate remains at 59.12 cents per 100 of assessed value meaning the average homeowner will pay $986.12 per year. Despite the construction boom we seem to see throughout Durham, the Durham County Tax Assessor reports that we can only expect a 2% increase in new taxable values for the 2016 budget, meaning a penny on the tax rate will equal $2,475,000. This rate includes a decrease in tax allocation to support the debt service fund to replace a large portion of the business privilege license tax that was eliminated by the state. This year, a dedicated portion of the tax rate was also established in the solid waste fund to more accurately account for those operational costs. 
Other allocations for transit and the housing fund remain the same in this year's budget. The proposed general fund expenditures include modest increases in personnel and operating costs and a significant decrease in transfers due to the decision to pay for solid waste collection through a dedicated property tax allocation, which I just spoke about in the previous slide. The economy is steadily rebounding and population growth in Durham continues. However, it remains important that we continue to scrutinize programs and services and limit any increases to what is needed to accommodate this population growth and cost factors and support the strategic plan. The proposed budget uses $1.7 million of fund balance for a variety of one-time costs. The city continues to enjoy an outstanding credit rating by all rating agencies, and I'm pleased to report that fund balance is projected to be at approximately 21 percent, which is well above the budget guideline of 12 percent. Residents continually rank employee courtesy and customer service high on the city's resident satisfaction survey. We want to keep that rating high as, we, as well as to improve upon it. To further strengthen customer service throughout the organization, I'm recommending a citywide review to, to determine how we can better coordinate customer service functions. We're also adding a new representative to the Durham One Call staff and acquiring a new smartphone app so that the public can more easily report problems to us. Residents have high expectations for city employees, and rightly so. They want innovation, courtesy, and exceptional customer service. As an organization, we must continue to reward employees who are committed to meeting and exceeding those expectations with excellence and creativity and without excuses. I am pleased to continue the city's pay for performance system and rewarding employees who perform at a high level as a top priority. Within the proposed pay for performance plan this year, employees would receive an average 3.5% pay increase, while police and fire plans will increase 3 to 5%. The city's self-insurance health plan continues to perform well, and this performance coupled with employee wellness initiatives will require health insurance rates to increase only 3%. This is the first rate increase over, in over three years. Strong partnerships continue to be at the heart of the city's progress. Our partnerships with Durham County, the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce, Durham Downtown Incorporated, and private and nonprofit developers and agencies is stronger than ever. At the same time, we strive to reach out to distressed communities to ensure that everyone, no matter where they live, work, or play, could be a part of our community's success. The Mayor's Poverty Reduction Initiative brought individuals as well as other organizations to the table to strategize and create ways to help many of our neighborhoods escape poverty. The administration and staff are ready to continue working with the various task forces to develop strategies and initiatives on this critically, critically important call to action to reduce poverty neighborhood by neighborhood and year by year. Last year saw our collaboration expand and strengthen as we announced a new joint economic development strategic plan with the county and other partners to attract development to Durham aimed at growing the economy and providing jobs for adults and youth in Durham. This plan serves as a guide for our future to retain businesses and attract investments as we grow Durham's tax base. To that end, approximately $2.2 million is budgeted for economic development purposes, including continuing the Downtown Business Improvement District at $0.07 cents per 100 assessed value on property within the Improvement District boundaries. Support of the art scene continues to be vital to our economy as well. Support for many festivals, support for mainstay festivals such as the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival, the American Dance Festival, as well as funding for newer events such as the Art of Cool Jazz Festival and the Bull City Sculpture Show continues in the pro proposed budget to help lasting impressions of the city's dedication to creativity and to the arts. Later this summer, we will be bringing forth a new partnership proposal with Durham County and the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau to establish a Durham Sports Commission with the goal of expanding sports tourism in Durham. Now let's turn to neighborhoods. As the strategic plan was updated, we asked what makes a great neighborhood? And here's what you told us. Neighbors who feel empowered by the city to improve their neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that have, had, have access to a variety of transportation. Neighborhoods that have various housing options 
that are safe and affordable. The city's neighborhood improvement services and community development departments work every day to partner with neighbors to meet those needs. To help strengthen these efforts, a code enforcement supervisor cut in prior budgets is recommended to be restored to ensure that code enforcement activities such as weedy lots and unsafe housing get the attention they need. Alternate ways to get around is important to residents, not just by vehicle, but by walking. To help meet that need, $25,000 is proposed funded to match a $100,000 grant to update the Durham Walks Plan. And no fare, charges, no fare changes are proposed for transit services. The new Go Durham buses, formerly known as Durham Area Transit Authority or DATA, are continuing to be rolled out. Expanded routes and improved service will continue to be announced early this fall. The Penny for Housing will continue to address creating and sustaining affordable housing needs. Without question, Southside will serve as a model for future mixed use and mixed income developments. Tremendous progress at Southside continues. Currently 44 of the 48 home ownership lots are sold, reserved, or have construction activity. 24 of those lots are sold to low to moderate income buyers. Construction on phase two with 20 additional lots is projected to start next summer. And for renters, the lofts apartments are also making great strides with 93 applications approved as of May 14th, of which 72 are low to moderate income renters. And when it comes to vacant and boarded properties, the city has raised the bar. Over the past five years, nearly 450 boarded properties have been eliminated. In addition, the NIS department is replacing plywood with clear impact resistance sheeting called polycarbonate to improve the appearance of vacant housing waiting to be transitioned to safe and suitable residences. Nowhere in this city are partnerships more and vital to in our work but to keep our communities safe and secure. As warranted, this area uses the greatest share of city's resources and personnel as well as facilities and equipment. In fact, public safety accounts for $91.4 million in the budget, with almost 62% of that going to law enforcement efforts to keep our communities safe and secure. Reducing crime remains a high priority for our city. And while we recognize that crime rates fluctuate quarter to quarter and year to year, no number of homicides, assaults, or other crimes is acceptable. While no additional police officers or firefighters are being recommended in the proposed budget, all sworn positions are fully funded. It's only reasonable to expect that as the city has continued to grow in population and size over the last few years, that which is expected to continue, we need to plan for significant uh, additional police and fire personnel. I'm committed to continuing to work with both the police and fire departments throughout this year to better evaluate and prioritize how existing resources are being deployed as well as what and how new resources would be deployed and what results the public can expect for any commitment of additional taxes directed here. Last week, we also, later this week, we will also continue the discussion regarding the work of the Violent Crime Reduction Task Force and recommendations from the Department of Justice, as well as preparing to support Councilmember Eddie Davis as he prepares to lead conversations about police and community relations. In addition to providing programs and services that directly affect residents, taking care of city buildings, parks, and roads is crucial for our future. For that reason, we continue to keep maintenance at the top of our priority list. City has made significant strides to commit funding over the past few years to address long-standing physical asset deficiencies. Certainly, the work that surrounds us as the ex exterior renovations to City Hall continue is just one example. Funding is included in the budget to increase deferred maintenance to $600,000. Additionally, one-time funding of $108,000 is proposed to allow the General Services Department to acquire and develop a robust asset management software system. While we've come a long way over the last few years, the condition of our streets continues to be a top concern for residents, according to the most recent survey. I am proposing that, in addition to the $500,000 for sidewalks, the street paving funding be increased to $2 million. Last year, City Council voted to dedicate one half cent of property tax, about $1.2 million, for maintenance of parks and recreation centers. It was a good start, 
but more work is needed for park maintenance throughout the city. Therefore, the proposed budget continues the dedicated half cent for much needed park maintenance, including fields and court repairs. An average 3% rate increase for water and sewer will generate about $2.9 million for ongoing maintenance of water lines and other infrastructure. And there's no increase recommended for stormwater rates this year due to modest growth in the stormwater fund. You'll see some of the other major capital projects listed here totaling more than $12.9 million for current and new projects. These projects are funded through a variety of fees, water and sewer revenues, revenue bonds, and other financing. At this point, we've done our best to recommend a budget that propels our city forward. It has been a collaborative process relying on the groundwork and longer term financial and strategic plans developed over the last few years and at the same time trying to predict what the immediate future holds. We remain committed to transparency in the city's budget as well as in the total city's total operations. The new open government portal is about to be launched next month to provide more direct access to city and county data. The city website is also undergoing a transformation with a key update to make it mobile friendly since more and more people are accessing websites through their smartphones and tablets. I am confident more so than ever that with this budget, Durham's future remains bright. So bright you'll need shades. Now where have I heard that? Uh, I won't go there. Your thoughts about the 2015-16 budget are important. Feel free to send your suggestions and comments to the city by email, on the city's Facebook page, on the Twitter, Twitter feed, by video submission on the city's YouTube channel, or even by contacting Durham One Call. Here's your chance to let us know what you think. Then we'll respond to your comments and answer as many questions as we can during our third annual E-Town Hall meeting on Monday, June 1st, which will be aired live on Durham Television Network and live streamed on the city's website. In addition to the E-Town Hall, here are some other ways you can let us know your thoughts. Copies of the preliminary budget are also available on the city's website, in the city clerk's office, and in the Budget Management Services Department. As always, special recognition and thanks to the Budget and Management Services uh, Director Bertha Johnson and her staff, along with all the city department directors for their superior leadership to ensure that our strategic plan guides as well as aligns with the city budget priorities. I continue to appreciate and value the close working relationship between the Mayor and City Council and City Administration as we think about what means to the most to us as a city now and for generations to come. I've heard it said that a well thought out budget is how a city shows its residents that it cares. Personally, I can think of nothing that illustrates the value of thinking about the future than children and grandchildren. That became too clear for me last week as my wife and I welcomed our first grandchild into the world. While the actions we take now affect how we live, work, and play, we must always consider how they'll help the future 10, 20, and 50 years from today if not for ourselves, for the people in our lives whom we care a lot about. Let's continue to work together and make Durham a place where great things happen. Thank you. Tom, that was excellent. Uh, I, th I think it was a very balanced and well presented. Uh, it certainly covered uh, the things that we'd heard uh, throughout our budget deliberations with the community. Uh, the fact that we are presenting a balanced budget with no tax increase, I'm certain is sweet to a lot of people's ears. But we also know we've got to spend the time of going through the actual details of the budget and we'll be doing that very shortly, but you put us in a, a great position, and uh, for that, we're very appreciative, and appreciative to the staff again. I know some of them are leaving, but uh, we understand that all these things that happen in this community, uh, and I'm talking about the positive things, uh, are really happen because of the result of our staff, and uh, we're very appreciative of that. Thank you, Mayor. I recognize 
Councilman Moffitt. It's, it's not, um, I, I, uh, I don't think we take time uh, very often to appreciate the work. I mean, we do of the staff quite frequently, but we don't always of the manager. And I think it was a good d a demonstration of the work that the manager does. I want to thank him for the budget. I look forward to the in-depth discussions that we're going to have with the department directors over May 26th and 27th. And I just want to comment that Durham, I mean, I just, I just think it's an extraordinarily well-managed city. And I'm particularly appreciative that this year's budget is less than the current year. And I know it's a reflection, Tom, of your commitment to doing more for the city with the resources that we have at hand. So thank you. We move to the next item, which is in a local agreement between item 29, in a local agreement between the city of Durham and Durham County to establish the Durham Workforce Development Board and its administrative entity under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014, effective July 1st, 2015. Uh, who's the staff versus Kevin? Kevin. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Uh, this evening, we have the opportunity to uh, have before you our proposed interlocal agreement uh, for the um, reestablishment of the Durham Workforce Development Board under the uh, pending new legislation uh, that is, has been um, brought forward by the U.S. Department of Labor, known as the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And so we'll take questions at this time. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, good evening. Kevin, could you explain to us the new composition of the board as well dictated by the federal government? I'd be happy to, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, the federal government has made a priority in this legislation to have smaller and more strategic workforce development boards. Um, as was the case under the Workforce Investment Act, uh, there is the, there, it, the intention is for there to be a majority of private sector business leaders. Um, we are recommending a maximum number of 25 members to the board at any given time. Currently, the board is at 29 members, and so we're, re we're recommending that uh, it uh, never be greater than 25. Um, as I said, that would be a, a majority of private sector membership. Um, there would also be a category related to um, a combination of community-based organizations, uh, members of uh, the labor community, as well as um, a me membership of uh, organizations that promote apprenticeships so that we can promote more work-based learning. And then there are also um, mandatory uh, and, and stipulated uh, agencies that are to be represented, such as um, an economic development or community development organization, um, an organization that uh, serves uh, those who are receiving voc vocational rehabilitation services, uh, a state employment service representative, uh, and a few other public um, agencies. My understanding is elected officials on the board is no longer mandated, uh, probably has never been mandated. Is that correct? That's correct. And so that is why uh, when you brought that to our attention, I said that I would certainly be willing to, to back off from the board uh, because if you look at it, we have the final say in what you're doing anyway. And so that is enough input for us and I think Steve agreed what I don't understand is why uh, the county would still want to have voice and the, the, the agency really authorized to carry out the mandates of this act are willing to pull back and why we are paying for staffing it we're willing to step back, yet there's no funding from them and they want to be a part. I don't want to sound selfish, but what I do want, I'm trying to understand why it became such an issue. Uh, and I wish I could have been at work session to bring these uh, questions out, but I'm troubled 
uh, about the amount of emphasis that has been placed on it. I think that you really need to be able to pay to play. And if they are going to be willing to help fund this department, then I think they owe, we owe them the right to serve. Otherwise, they should back off just like we did. And just like the advertisement of the food line, and that's just my five cents. <laughs> I'm just speaking from my heart. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. We shouldn't try to micromanage everything uh, that happens uh, in Durham. Thank you. Other, other recognize the Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I agree with Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, we, we are both happy to uh, withdraw ourselves from membership on the committee and we think that'll help the committee function better it'll be smaller it'll be it'll be a more it'll, it'll be a larger percentage of the of the committee of the of the committee will be from the private sector and that's the intention of the legislation and, and I think we've felt all along there there have been too many people on it so I just want to express my support for her position and um, and I hope that, and I will say that we, we can still have a liaison relationship. The mayor wants to appoint liaisons. That's great. And when you all need us to come, we can be there for any advice and, or, or that you might want or any information that you want to convey to us. And so I appreciate what the mayor pro tem has said. I am in total support of that. And uh, I hope that, uh, I think it will be a more efficient group if, if some of us elected officials will back off of it. So I, I hope the county will, our friends in the county will take that into account. Thank you. So can I, can I ask a question because I haven't, haven't uh, gotten involved in this. So right now, well, what's proposed, there are 25 members a, a at maximum, the maximum. A maximum, right. Right now we have how many elected officials serving? Do we have four or two or three? Four. We have two from the city and two from the county. Correct. So if we stayed at 25 maximum and reduce it by four, it possibly 21. No, we, we're currently at 29. So we're No, but we're going to reduce four. it to 25, right? Correct. With okay. no, and and, and if we don't have any county commissioners or commi uh, council people on, that's another four slots that don't have to be filled. No, the, the, recommend, the recommended maximum of 25 would exclude the elected officials. That's how we're Oh, so you've already 21. taken them off. Okay, well, so what's that, the issue? That's, well, that's, that's, the that's the recommendation that would take effect July 1st, officially. And the county has agreed to it or hasn't agreed to the it? The county did agree to it last Monday uh, evening. Okay, so what's the issue? And if they've agreed not to have any elected officials on it, what, what's the issue? Is there an issue? Is that right, Kevin? Are you sure, though? On, on May, on May 11th, that, right. So since, since our work session, they agreed to it by 3-2 votes. Since our work session, correct. Yes. Well, I moved the item then. <laughs> right. uh, question here. Uh, well, since we got a motion and a second, you discussing. <laughs> Recognize Councilman Katari. Thank you. I just, uh, Kevin wanted to be completely clear. I mean, I definitely support the withdrawal of the elected officials, but um, the way I read option one, it had 25, and option two had 26. So are we voting on either of the options? I just wanted to be really clear about the number. Yes, Council Member Katadi, that's correct. So what we're recommending is option one, okay. schedule B1, which would have a maximum of 25 members. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Any further discussion? If not, the question's been called, it hasn't been called, I'm calling it. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Vote passes seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, the next item is item 20. Twenty-four general business agenda public hearings. Did I miss something? Yeah. Uh, Twenty-four second amendment to the economic incentive contract between the Jensen Group LLC and the City of Durham for capital investment in downtown Durham. 
Mr. Mayor, I apologize for not formally introducing myself before. <laughs> Kevin Dick with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. And this evening, we are recommending a second extension to the contract between the City of Durham and the Gentian Group for the uh, redevelopment of the um, former Mutual Community Savings Bank into what would, what would be called the Hotel Durham. Um, the Hotel Durham would add uh, necessary hotel rooms uh, to our downtown and bring forth um, jobs in the hospitality and tourism industry. Um, this project was uh, slated to be completed by April 30th. However, due to delays um, that were not under, uh, not within the developer's control, um, they encountered um, some, they encountered delays that uh, prevented the construction from being completed by April 30th. And so we are recommending an extension through July uh, 31st, which uh, should enable the project to be completed. Uh, you've heard the staff recommendation. This is a public hearing. Let me ask, is it anyone in the, well, first of all, the questions by members of the staff. If not, is it anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public has to speak on this item. Bring the matter back before the board. Public hearing is closed. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. The vote passes 7 0. Thank you. Any other items to come before the council? If not, we're adjourned at 7 48 p.m. Thank you.